Hi, this is Dr. Cook, your Chem 240 instructor. Let's take a look at the next video. In the previous video, we talked about some generalities of reaction mechanisms. What are some elementary steps of reactions that take place stepwise? How we portray them in terms of reaction progress and reaction energy diagrams. And now I want to focus a little bit more closely on specifically the electrophilic addition of hydrogen halides to alkenes. And we call this an electrophilic addition because if we see that the double bond has a lot of electron density associated with the pi bond, that's the source of reactivity for alkenes. That is electron density that is looking for something that's electron deficient. In other words, we're looking for something that's electrophilic or electron loving something that's lacking in electrons, that would be HBr. HBr is one example of an electrophile. HBr has a polarized bond, so this hydrogen is very positively charged, and this is why it acts as an acid. So this is our electrophile, the electron-loving species, something that's deficient, looking for electrons, and this is our nucleophile, or the nucleus-loving species, nucleophile is looking for something that is deficient of electrons. It has electrons that wants to give up. And so the double bond electrons react with the proton of HBr and that gives us the hydrogen in the product. The other carbon is en ending up deficient and the Br ends up on the second carbon. We're going to talk about this mechanism in some detail. If we portray this reaction mechanism in each of its steps, we can see that what happens in this reaction is a breaking of the pi bond. Again, those electrons are taking the proton or giving it to the proton, the electrophilic species, to form a new carbon-hydrogen bond. Those electrons came from the original pi bond. And when that pi bond breaks to form a bond of hydrogen to one carbon, that leaves the adjacent carbon deficient. So we have generated a carbocation, intermediate. This is a reactive species. In the next step, we have the bromide ion, which is resulting from breaking the proton off, which forms a bond to the carbon uh, with the plus charge to generate now the new carbon bromine bond. Again, overall, we've added HBr across the double bond, where H plus added on one side and Br minus added on the other. We can depict this in terms of a reaction energy diagram, in the same way we had discussed previously where you can see our reactants, our alkene, and our HBr have some energy to start with. And as they react together, as they come together and start forming and breaking bonds, you go through a transition state, the highest energy point, and when the double bond is completely broken and we've taken the proton and formed the new bond, now we have the intermediate carbocation. This intermediate lies in the energy well, and that intermediate then goes on to react in the second step with the bromide up a transition state and then down to the final products. This happens to be an exothermic reaction and energy is released or we're going downhill in energy from starting materials to products. So this reaction proceeds forward. Now in this reaction, the slowest step is the first step of the reaction. As you can see, the activation energy is the highest for that step and that's the highest barrier that we have to climb in order to get from starting materials over to products. When we talk about alkenes that are now differentially substituted, that is, there's different amounts of substitution on one end or the other of a double bond, then we have the possibility of potentially forming multiple products or regioisomers. Um, these are constitutional isomers, and it all depends on which end the proton ends up on and which end the bromine ends up on in this example. So if you take one butene, and react with HBr, what's observed in that reaction is that you generate two bromobutane in 80% yield, and the one bromobutane is not formed. The reaction is selective for putting the hydrogen on the least substituted carbon and bromine on the most substituted carbon. And we have to ask ourselves, what gives rise to this kind of regio selectivity? We can see in other cases that this also occurs if we have two propene molecule and add HBr. Again, 90% yield of a product where hydrogen adds to the least substituted carbon and bromine is attached to the most substituted carbon. Same thing with methylcyclopentene. One methylcyclopentene reacts with HBr to put the bromine on the more substituted carbon, hydrogen on the least substituted carbon. This is a general trend seen in all of these electrophilic addition reactions with hydrogen halide. How do we explain this? A Russian chemist came up with a rule of thumb to describe this behavior. This is basically a result of empirical observation and he came up with this empirical rule. And Markovnikov originally stated this, 
when an unsymmetrically substituted alkene reacts with hydrogen halide, the hydrogen adds to the carbon that has the greater number of hydrogens, the less substituted one, and the halogen adds to the carbon having fewer hydrogens, or the more substituted one. That is simply stating what's observed. It doesn't really explain why, but it is an empirical rule that one can use to follow to predict the outcome of a reaction based on lots and lots and lots of examples that uh, went that way in terms of selectivity. Well, in order to truly understand the origin of Markovnikov selectivity in the addition of hydrogen halide, we need to understand the structure of the intermediate. And the intermediate is a carbocation. Carbocations, carbons that are lacking one bond in electrons, are sp2 hybridized and planar. So the structure of a carbocation you can see is a plane where the three groups are all in a plane, just like an, a pi bond or a double bond. That has a p orbital in the middle, and that p orbital is an empty orbital, so a carbocation is plus charged. Now what's interesting about a carbocation is that depending on the degree of alkyl substitution of a carbon, that carbocation is more or less stable. We see a trend in stability of carbocations when we go from least substituted, they're the least stable or highest in energy, to most substituted where they're lower energy and uh, more stable. So the trend goes in this way. So methyl, when you have just a CH3 carbocation, that would be, I guess, considered zero degree of alkyl substitution. That is the least stable or highest in energy. If you put one alkyl group on, so ethyl carbocation, we have a carbocation on a primary carbon that's more stable than methyl. And a secondary carbocation is more stable than a primary carbocation, and the tertiary carbocation is the most stable of all of these. And that is because these alkyl groups tend to lend themselves to stabilizing that by a term we call hyperconjugation. That is, the adjacent bonds do donate some kind of electron density field to that plus charge, helping to neutralize it. We can see that neutralization as the charge spreads out. So these are those carbocations now showing the electrostatic maps. And what you observe is that the CH3 carbocation is the most uh, electropositive. You can see the large purple-blue color, meaning it's very, very, very positively charged. If you put even a single methyl group on, this is the ethyl carbocation, so it's a primary carbocation, that blue color is essentially uh, diminished greatly. Two alkyl groups helping to donate electron density, it's even better, so secondary, and then the tertiary, you can see there's hardly any blue left when we calculate the electron density of the ele on the electrostatic map. So that's why this is the most stable, the tertiary carbocation. And that's due to, again, alkyl groups donating electron density slightly through the inductive effects and hyperconjugation. So we can see here that if you align bonds with the p orbital, the CH bonds of the adjacent alkyl group actually donate some of their electron density to that p orbital of the plus charge. That's what helps stabilize the plus charge when you have more alkyl substitution. But the general rule of thumb, what you really need to remember is that the more highly substituted the carbocation with alkyl groups, the more stable it is. So tertiary is most stable, secondary is a little less stable, primary is a little less stable, and methyl is the least stable. So now if we compare the reaction energy progress diagrams for the two different pathways that would lead to either uh, the one product or the other, we can see that the stability of the carbocation intermediate matters. So in this example, we have the proton occurring on the less substituted carbon and the carbocation forming on the more substituted carbon. And so what that does is it leads to a carbocation intermediate, which is lower in energy than if you were to do that the other way around. So if the proton is being reacted with the more substituted carbon, leaving the primary carbon with a plus charge, that's a higher energy intermediate, and thus the activation energy to get there is higher. So that's why we favor the reaction that would give the lowest energy pathway overall, the formation of the more stable carbocation. So we can restate Markovnikov's rule to actually include the origin of the result as opposed to just an empirical observation, and that simply stated is when an unsymmetrically substituted alkene reacts with hydrogen halide, or any electrophile for that matter, the protonation, or the electrophilic part, occurs to form the more stable carbocation. So protonation occurs to form the intermediate which is most stable and then the regioselectivity is dictated by that stability.
In addition to hydrogen halide, we can add all kinds of different species, whether we have water or other things we're going to see, borane or hydrogen or things like that. What is a general trend among all these is that we're adding an electrophilic species to generate a carbocation or some kind of cation intermediate and then adding something which is negatively charged or has electrons. It may be a neutral species like water. Now in this case, water is a very weak acid relative to something like HCl or HBr. HBr will react perfectly fine with a double bond to protonate at first, but water can't protonate the double bond. Nothing will happen if you simply mix these two together. However, if you add an acid catalyst, in this case I've shown an example of phosphoric acid, you just need a little bit of a catalytic amount. It could be sulfuric acid, it could be many different things. That acid initiates the reaction. So in the hydration or the addition of water to a double bond, what happens in the first step is still the same protonation. It's just occurring from phosphoric acid. So the electrons in the double bond will abstract a proton from phosphoric acid. That will generate a carbocation intermediate. That hydrogen adds to the end carbon. I'm going to highlight it here, leaving the carbocation on the middle carbon. The byproduct is H. 2PO4 minus, so the anion of phosphoric acid. Now that anion isn't very good at forming new bonds with things with electron density, so instead what happens is electrons from the water react with the plus charge. Instead of a Br minus, we have water reacting to form, I'll highlight that hydrogen, to form now a new oxygen carbon bond, but in this case it's H2O which is added, and so the hydrogen hasn't come off yet. Uh, in this case, we have now three bonds to oxygen. Oxygen overall has a formal charge of plus. And one way to keep track of, of things and make sure you're doing it right is to look at what you're reacting with. We have something which is positively charged reacting with something which is neutral. So overall, what you form has to have a positive charge somewhere. So the only difference between this mechanism and the mechanism we described for hydrogen halide is that the acid comes from a different species than what is actually adding to the double bond as the second step. Um, and then the resulting hydronium ion has to be deprotonated to neutralize it. And what happens is the phosphate takes a proton off, the electrons are returned back to the oxygen as a lone pair to form the OH group as the product. This is a common type of acid catalyzed reaction. Notice in this process we regenerate our phosphoric acid that we started with, hence it's a catalyst. It helps the reaction occur, but remains unchanged from the beginning to the end of the reaction. We get it back at the end of the reaction. Well, we can also add diatomic halogen to double bonds. When we have something like Cl2, Br2, or I2, these halogens are actually polarized when they come close to a double bond. So if you have something like a bromine-bromine bond. We can think about this as one of them being something with a plus charge and one of them being something with a minus charge. It's very similar to HBr except we have BrBr. So in this case we're adding not a proton but we're adding the equivalent of a Br plus to this double bond. The reaction would occur with the electron density. One side would take the Br plus and the other side takes the Br minus. Overall, we get addition of a double bond, putting a halogen on either end of the double bond that was originally there. Now that halogenation has some other little interesting aspects to it. If we take a look at cyclopentene and carry out this reaction, what we see is that the original double bond is fixed in geometry, and we add bromine, we get only the trans product that occurs. And that seems unusual, because if we were to do this reaction where we form a carbocation. I'm going to look at this from the side on view. Let's say we take the Br plus and add the Br to it on one side of the double bond. On the other side there's the p orbital empty plus charge. The Br minus in this case could add either to the top or to the bottom. If it adds to the bottom, we'd get the trans product or the anti-addition product. If it added to the top side, the product you would get would be the cis product. But we don't see any of the cis product being formed. Okay, That doesn't occur. So what dictates this selectivity and why would bromine add only from the bottom? 
Well, it actually turns out that because the halogen is bigger than a proton and it also has lone pairs, what happens when you have a halogen reacting with a double bond is that the lone pair, so you think about that lone pair on the bromine, actually forms a bond with the carbocation. So you actually don't form a carbocation, you actually form a bridge species where the bromine is bridging both of those carbons as the intermediate and the formal charge of the plus is now on the bromine. That's more stable than the free carbocation. And it only occurs because the fact that bromine has these lone pairs which can reach over and form a bridging ring compound. So here's the mechanism of electrophilic halogenation. The double bond reacts with the bromine to form a bridging bromine ring compound of bromonium. The bromine minus that is the result of that has to add. At the same time it breaks the one of those carbon bromine bonds returning the electrons back to the bromine to become neutralized. And so the result is that the top side of this molecule is blocked from the bromine. The bromine can only add from the bottom. So these two bromines always end up on opposite sides of a ring when you start with a double bond in a ring. Well, let's take a look at this problem that I've illustrated here. And this is another aspect of this electrophilic addition reaction to double bonds that we need to think about carefully. So if we take this double bond, which has uh, a carbon which is less substituted and a carbon which is most substituted, and we react that with HCl, what's observed is that we form 10% of the product that we would expect, that is the hydrogen added to the N carbon, the chlorine added to the middle carbon. This would be normal Markovnikov selectivity. However, another product, actually the major product in this case, is a result of a reaction where the hydrogen added to the N carbon, but the chlorine added in further to a more highly substituted carbon. And it actually happens to have added to this carbon, where originally we had a hydrogen present. So we have to ask ourselves, why does this react to give a product where there was no double bond at that position to begin with? Well, it's because there's a carbocation rearrangement. So let's take a close look at this mechanism. If you do the first step, you add the proton to the double bond, you would form an intermediate plus charge where that hydrogen we added, and I'm going to circle it in blue here, that's the original hydrogen we added, to form this intermediate. And then if we react that with Cl minus, it will react to form the observed product that we see 10% yield. In the other case, I'm going to highlight this in green, uh, we have a product where the chlorine added to this carbon, and initially there's a hydrogen in this position. So how do we get a plus charge in that position? That's what we have to figure out, because in order to get the product on the right, this chloride has to react with an intermediate where the plus charge is in this position, um, and our original hydrogen had added there. So how do we get from this carbocation to this carbocation? And that's the question. So what happens is it's a rearrangement reaction. The hydrogen on this carbon on the ring with its electrons basically hops over. We call this a carbocation rearrangement. That hydrogen ends up on this carbon where the original carbocation that was produced was. But that shifts the carbocation over more. Why would it do that? Well, because we've gone to a more stable carbocation. So notice the degree of alkyl substitution in this molecule. This carbocation is on a secondary carbon, whereas this carbocation is on a tertiary carbon. So if we think about the reaction, here's the energy diagram to give you a better picture of this. We start with some starting materials. We go up to some intermediate, and that would be the secondary carbocation. That can react to form the product that can react to form product one. In order to get product two, what we would have to do is react to form another intermediate. And so this, this um, rearrangement occurs to give now a more stable intermediate. So we've gone downhill in energy. And then that gives product two. So the only reason why this would happen is if it can rearrange from a less stable to a more stable carbocation, it will. If it's not becoming more stable, you won't see that rearrangement occur. It is not only hydrogens which can shift over with its electrons to do carbocation rearrangements, but alkyl groups can as well. So if we look at this example, we have 
three CH3 groups here. I'm going to highlight them which we have in the product, but in this case we see the normal product in 17% yield, but again the major product has one of those CH3 groups shifted over one carbon, and the chlorine now ends up in a place that there was no double bond to begin with. And it's the exact same process. You react with HCl to form the secondary carbocation with the original hydrogen adding at this position, and if you add chloride to this intermediate, you would get the product on the left, okay? However, we can become more stable if we shift the whole methyl group over with its electrons. Just pop that over to form a new carbocation intermediate, which would look like this. Which would look like this, where the CH3 group now has moved over, leaving the carbocation on a tertiary carbon, where it was originally on a secondary carbon. And now if we add chloride to that intermediate, we get the observed major product in this case. So carbocation rearrangements will occur again with either hydrogen or groups like a methyl group shifting over with its electrons from the sigma bond, leaving that carbon it was attached to deficient and changing the position of the plus charge.